Hello AP Psychology students. Today I'm going to be coming to you with a hopefully short lesson on the treatment of psychological disorders. I just felt like there was a little bit that we didn't get to in class that I would really like to um, make sure that I share with you. Um, so if you decide uh, or is determined that you need treatment for psychological disorders, there are um, a number of routes you can go. I really don't think Lucy, by the way, in this picture is going to be your best option. But I do want to let you know about the different health professionals that might be involved in, in care for psychological disorders. Psychiatrists are MDs. They have gotten their medical doctor degree, and then they've gone on to do a, a fellowship or a residency in specifically psychiatry. They are almost always going to use a biological approach to treatment. So they're going to be interested in things like medication, electroconvulsive therapy, um, deep brain stimulation, or other kinds of biological approaches. This is especially important for things like um, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, where really uh, medication is almost necessary to help those disorders be in control. Now, oftentimes someone will see both a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and I'd like to just differentiate a little bit between a clinical psychologist and a counseling psychologist. Um, a clinical psychologist almost always has a PhD, and they are going to specialize in working alongside psychiatrists or independently um, with people with more um, severe disorders. Um, counseling psychologists have a master's or a PhD and they are they can be in a variety of roles such as even a guidance counselor at a school or a, a, a counselor who works specifically with people with depression or anxiety um, and you know whether or not you say clinical or counseling psychologist doesn't matter so much as their particular skill in helping you um, or your loved one social workers some also specialize in um, treatment of psychological disorders um, the bsw is a bachelor's of social work uh, but most likely if you're going to see a social worker for treatment of psychological disorders it will be someone with a master's or an msw um, something i'd like you to keep in mind as uh, we as we uh, something to keep in mind as we talk about psychotherapies is um well they don't look like this anymore this is actually the office of um dr freud who i'll be introducing to you in a little bit there he is um and he worked in vienna and this is what i think a lot of people think of when they think about a psychotherapist's office is you know you lay on a couch and you talk to a psychologist but in reality it doesn't really look anything like that this is an example of a psychologist's office um i happen to know this person whose office this is and you'll you'll generally find a couple of comfortable chairs i mean usually they'll have a desk and a computer or something like that so that they can uh um, you know, take some notes or whatever, but it's usually just a, a really comfortable setting. Um, so I do want to emphasize, however, that most people do recover from short periods of depression or anxiety without treatment. This is part of who we are as humans. We're going to get depressed from time to time. We're going to get um, anxious from time to time. That is who we are and how we're designed to be and this is called spontaneous remission so as soon as you feel depressed or anxious it's not really you know necessary unless you're experiencing a lot of distress to, to seek treatment right away um, most people who um, do go to psychotherapy report that um, it going to psychotherapy helps more than just medication alone now, I will say a lot of uh, doctors, even general physicians, will uh, prescribe antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications, and they will tell you, you should try to find a psychotherapist. Um, some people are resistant to doing that. I think there's still a little bit of a stigma with that, and, and, I, and I certainly understand that. It can be really awkward. Um, I do really want to emphasize that most therapists have different areas of expertise and methods. If someone has OCD, you need to see someone who specializes in OCD because there are specific behavioral therapies for that. 
PTSD. I talked about EMDR in class. If, if someone is suspected to have PTSD, they're going to want to make sure that that individual that they see has experience working with trauma patients because they bring with them a different set of symptoms and a different set of treatment possibilities than someone, for example, with depression or anxiety. And someone with bipolar and schizophrenia are going to be needing to see both a psychiatrist and potentially a psychologist to help them manage their symptoms. Here's another thing that I'd like to say. If whatever you're doing, whoever you're saying, seeing, doesn't feel, if they just doesn't feel right, if you don't feel like you're connecting with that person or that they're understanding you, whether their methodology is not working, then it's okay that might not be the right person for you and it's okay to not continue seeing that person what i do recommend doing if you do decide that you need to to see a therapist at some point in your life is just um, looking at their bio bios online pretty much every health system here we have like park nicollet and fairview systems and alina um, they have uh they all have web pages that describe their backgrounds and their areas of expertise for example someone might have postpartum depression that's not an unusual diagnosis for someone after they've had a, an infant and given birth um and you would if that's a problem that you're having you'd want to look for someone who has experience in that area like was with ptsd or anything else um so i'm going to introduce you to my two friends here freud and vince okay so freud dr freud he's pretty well known um so is vince to be honest he's a painter You've maybe heard of him before. Um, he uh, did some really fine work uh, a long time ago, but you know he had he had some problems. So you know, mm, you know, if Vince is just like, ah, I think I need to go see somebody. I'm not happy. In fact, I'm so unhappy that I, oh my gosh, I cut off my ear. Yes, this doll does have a removable ear. Um, well, that is what Vincent Van Gogh actually did in real life. So let's say Vince decides to go to a psychoanalyst. This is called psychodynamic therapy. And this was actually popular in the early 20th century. Um, it was pioneered by Freud. And um, the aim is to uncover repressed conflicts, especially from childhood. So if Vince here were to go see Freud here, um, or anyone like Freud in modern day, um, they would be trying to recall, have you recall events from your childhood. The therapy is very non-directive um, and the methods that they use are uh, free association. So mm, tell me about your first memory. What does that remind you of? And then they'll just kind of have you, like the thought bubble shows here, just describe whatever comes to mind. They'll also do dream analysis. And then something called transference will occur in psychoanalysis. So let's say that Vince really does have a problem with his dad. What uh, Freud would want Vince to do is start talking to him as if he is his dad. Like, why did you do this to me? You were so harsh on me. You didn't like that I was an artist. You wanted me to be, I don't know, a football player. I don't think football existed at the time. But but that's kind of the goal in, in uh, that type of theory. But uh, psychoanalysis itself is criticized for its length and its expense. It usually involves several uh, days a week for several weeks, and it's not as scientifically rigorous as some of the other approaches. Now, um, I said I wasn't gonna make this a long video, so I am gonna try to go through this fairly quickly, and I might even and skip a, a couple of slides in here. Okay, all right, so the humanistic therapies um, are gonna be used for depression, anxiety, and adjustment. They are really client-centered, so it's all about making Vince here feel good about himself. So, hey, Vince, you know, you got to stop focusing on the past. You need to th start thinking about free will. You're an artist. Go ahead. Do your art. You know, don't worry about the past. Um, you might have group therapy with humanistic therapies. Um, and the uh, the humanistic therapist will want you to take immediate responsibility for just making your life better and expressing your free will 
Now, someone's not going to tell you they're a humanist. You're not going to find that on their bio, but you can kind of get a sense that that's the way they're going as you talk to them. So therapists sort of have like a pre-existing bias um, as they uh, do their work. Now, another form of therapy that is um, actually I'm having trouble with my PowerPoint. Um, really important for things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, autism spectrum disorders. These are going to be the behavioral therapies. Um, and it's very important. These are some disorders that we did not talk about in class, but if you have a child someday, for example, who does have a behavioral disorder in particular, what you'll want to find is a behavioral therapist who will help you figure out something like a, a token economy to help someone perhaps in the autism spectrum who to follow through on tasks or with oppositional defiant disorder. And so these are an important therapeutic tool. I'm not gonna spend as much time on them because we didn't really talk about these disorders. Um, we did talk about classical conditioning therapies already. Um, so I'm gonna basically uh, whip through this slide. If you need to uh, take a look at this again and, and try to remind yourself, we talked about them when it came to things like overcoming OCDs. I showed you a video of a woman who had to overcome agoraphobia and her fear of elevators. So hopefully you can remember that. Um, and that there are two kinds, uh, systematic desensitization and virtual reality exposure. Um, the cognitive therapies are what I want to describe here. Now, some people lump these in with cognitive uh, behavioral therapies, but I'm going to refer to them as cognitive therapies here because they really focus on thoughts. So Freud and Vince, Okay, so, uh, you know, Freud, I mean, Vince, rather, he's feeling a little depressed, you know, like, dang, you know, I just don't feel good about my artwork. I think that I'm kind of a loser. You know, nobody's really liking my style right now. It's all about me. It's really a problem. You know, and, and, if, and if Vince were to go to a cognitive therapist, you know, that therapist would say, you know, Vince, I, I really want to get to know you. Like, like, let's talk about your artwork for a little bit. You know, why Why do you think it's so bad? Well, you know, I just think people don't like it. Well, you know, I think let's let's explore that a little bit further. Why do you think people don't like it? And, and what do you think about it? So in the um, Aaron Beck's approach, Aaron Beck was really a pioneer in therapy, um, especially in, in talk therapy and cognitive therapy. And he really stressed the importance of the relationship between the therapist and the client. Um, so a cognitive therapist is gonna ask more gentle questions to reveal the irrational thinking patterns. Like, you know what, Vince? It's okay. People don't have to like your artwork. What's important is that you like your artwork, okay? And, you know, I'd like you to keep a journal for the next week. And every time you find yourself thinking these negative thoughts, I want you to write it down and then and we'll, then we'll talk about it next week. Okay, so I've seen cognitive therapy work really well. Um, and, and uh, you know, I know people have who have used this approach and, and it's, it can be very effective. Now, some people need a much more direct approach. So we've got, you know, we've got the therapist here and we've got Vince. And, you know, the therapist is just going to say, hey, Vince, knock it off. Okay, so someone said, what was the activating event? They said they didn't like your art and you believed that you're a loser because of it? You're not a loser. That's your belief. We need to change that belief. Vince, you're not a loser. Tell yourself you're not a loser. So what Ellis and you know Beck believe the same thing too, but what Ellis believed is that we have this activating event. We create these beliefs in our own mind and then we have the consequential emotional response. And so in the rational emotive behavior therapy model, this individual is going to this therapist is going to say, "Hey, knock it off, accept that you are who you are, accept that, hey, you know what? Everyone's not going to like you and that's okay. And you know what? You're going to have to accept that other people might not like your artwork, but that's okay too. And so it's really about what a therapist will call radical acceptance. That can be hard. Sometimes you don't want to do it, but sometimes it's the healthiest way of dealing with your emotions. 
The next approach, cognitive behavioral therapy, blends the traditions of cognitive therapy, so changing that self-defeating thinking with behavior therapy. And so actually like changing your behavior. And I talked about this on my mood disorder video, but you know, the therapist in this case would be saying, you know, Vince, you gotta get out and exercise. Vince, you gotta get good sleep. Vince, you gotta exercise. I think I just mentioned that. But you know, we gotta break this chain of negative thinking and unhealthy behaviors. You gotta stop drinking. You gotta stop doing the weed. Whatever it is you're doing, you gotta stop it. And so a cognitive behavioral therapist, like I said, using those cognitive te techniques, but also trying to interrupt uh, the cycle at any point, whether it's behavior, emotion, thought, is gonna start leading you to better health. And then finally, the last form of therapy I wanna talk about is called dialectical behavior therapy. Um, this, I should have moved this picture up on the slide, but this says distress tolerance here. This therapy ha was really devised only within the last several years by a therapist named Marshall Linehan. And it was specifically um, developed to deal with borderline personality disorder, which as I mentioned in class is a very serious personality disorder that can cause um, one to be self-injurious. Um, it, it, it's used to treat people who are victims of sexual abuse, victims of complex trauma, which can include a long-standing trauma from childhood or from uh, a domestic abuse relationship, or drug addiction. When you commit to dialectical behavior therapy, it's really a 24 week uh, therapy um, period. And that's almost a half a year. And it involves both individual and group therapy. And so what are the goals of this therapy? Well, right here, you've got this blue part here, mindfulness. Mindfulness, the idea behind that is that you're just trying to focus on the here and now what you can find that is beautiful, and lovely here and now. Um, taking those negative thoughts that are coming and putting them up on a cloud or floating them down a stream. Uh, distress tolerance is gonna be six weeks and that is obscured here, but it says distress tolerance. So learning to manage those times when you feel distress, what are you gonna do? And there are workbooks that go with this. This is not just showing up, you gotta work at it. Then you'll have mindfulness for two weeks. Then you'll work on interpersonal um, relationships. So how do you handle those times when you're having an interpersonal conflict and you're starting to feel those emotions well up within, within you? Then two weeks of mindfulness and then emotional regulation. How do you handle those emotions when they do come up? This is a very structured therapeutic approach. It has some really good results for borderline personality disorder, but I will tell you it's not for everyone. Some people get into this program and they're like, it's not working, I can't do this. There's some triggers in there that it doesn't work. However, for some people, it is life-saving. So I'm sorry, I took a lot more than the six minutes that I said I was gonna do, but I just felt like this was really important to share with you today. Thank you all so much. This has been an unprecedented time in, uh, you know, I think in our world and, um, and, and in our lives and in our education. And I just appreciate you all so much. Thank you.